Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Peacemaker podcast presented by Full Circle Network, Full Circle Cinema. This is a Full Circle Cinema podcast, and you are listening to the last episode for now of our podcast covering Peacemaker. This is the this is it. This is the season finale. It's all come to this. And I'm joined today for this monumental podcast by Jackson Hayes, editor-in-chief of Full Circle Cinema. Say hello, Jackson. Thank you for having me, Ernesto. Happy to of be course, here. Of course. Of course. And all and of course, Christian Hubbard, uh lead news editor, Full Circle Cinema. We made it. Episode eight, baby. Let's do it. We're here. We made it. I can't believe it. I didn't make it for last week, but I just want to say you guys did an awesome job. Jackson did a great job hosting. Christian backing him up. It was fantastic. Jackson rocked that. Yeah, but I'm back. I'm here now. You didn't think I was going to miss the finale, did you? Uh, So we're here at the end of the road after the crazy hype up cliffhanger of episode seven, which revealed the cow, which revealed the slow-mo walk of the whole team in the getting into the veterinary van ready to face the cow. We're here. And it's starting. And I just want to say this episode has one of the funniest openings. It's really casual because it's it's funny because the ending of the last episode was super hype. Everyone's all amped up, ready to go. And then the next episode is just all of them just sitting in the van quietly, just listening to music to the most inappropriate song. It's hilarious. And then out of bio and um, still vulnerable and sad after watching Eagly Hug Peacemaker. She tries to apologize to him, and it's just nothing but raspberries from him and Vigilante. What did you guys think of that nonchalant, casual opening, Jackson? I think it was the perfect way to open a final episode. I mean, the the potty humor, the you know, the the jokes, the the taking the situation not so seriously. I mean, that's what Peacemaker and Vigilante have done the entire time, no matter where the stakes are. They've been there, done that, so they're not really all that stressed out, even though everyone else can be you know, a little high maintenance. I think uh, they they bring a lot of levity, and I think it was perfect in that situation. Christian, what'd you think of that hilarious uh, opening with all the raspberries? I thought all the fart noises were hilarious. I thought Adebayo's reactions to the fart noises were hilarious. But I I, I thought that um, uh, Vigilante Adrian's uh, reaction to like the 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 tension was the the was the funniest part of the whole opening. Like we just had a really sick time murdering Peacemaker's dad, and this guy has just got <laughs> blown up. And the last last time we saw him, he's still recovering from all that. Like he's just starting to like we're having fun here. We're supposed to be having fun. Why are you guys fighting and bitching and moaning at each other? Like I thought that was just peak Adrian Chase, just absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it was it was a really funny uh, moment, and Peacemaker still obviously very hurt by what Autobio did, but you know he's handling it the best way he can. That is very immaturely, and uh, they they come to a stop, and Harcourt you know opens the door, let them out, and we get the opening one last time. This intro with so many people who are either dead or about to be apparently because of the stakes of this mission. So since this is the last time we're watching this intro, probably ever. Uh, what do you what do you guys think of the wigwam intro? Do you want to taste it? You know, over the season, over the course of the season, James Gunn said it's supposed to get darker. But how do you guys feel about it by the time we're at the end here, uh, Christian? I think it's I I noticed something different um, each time I see the opening uh, and having conversation with my mom who has known John Cena as long as I've known John Cena since he debuted in the WWE in 2002. She hates John Cena. I love John Cena, so it's a bit of a difference. She's like, the boy got no rhythm, but John Cena is hitting every single note. Uh, But I think that um, Adebayo's wife, who is standing right next to John Cena during the intro, like she gets more screen time during this intro than she does during the entire series, right? She's like (laughs) right there in the the forefront. She's throwing up the middle finger. (laughs) <laughs> Jackson, what do you think of the of the intro now overall? Like like you said, James Gunn mentioned, I mean, it changes every episode. I think last week it was kind of a, this heavy hitting, like, you know, it cut into this very emotional moment with Chris in the bathroom, you know, just being distraught about, you know, his brother and him being framed and all this whole situation. And I think this episode, it took a completely different meaning in that, you know, it was the calm before the storm in a way, like this one last time we get to see this kind of, this, you know, song and dance literally just for everyone to to like take a moment to breathe before the the craziness of the finale actually begins yeah do we know if that's adrian if that's freddie strama actually hitting those like those those 
backflips and stuff, those like those somersaults when Vigilante is do, going through the, the motions of the intro. Is that actually him? I'd like to think so. I'd like to Just believe impressive. in magic. <laughs> I'd like to believe in a more magical world and say, yeah, that is Freddy Stroma hitting he's every single one of those. <laughs> I'm sure he's doing the basic choreography also. Imagine if he just got to get out of that and it was just like a double wearing the mask and he's the only one that didn't have to learn all those silly moves. He's just watching it next to James Gunn. <laughs> but we do have to we do have to remember he was recast, so I don't know if that had oh anything to do with true. it. Like, cause I mean, I don't the, the other guy clearly wouldn't have fit in the same costume that Freddie Stroma did. Um, so I don't know if he was like superimposed after and they just used the costume. So I, I have no idea. But I feel like you've brought up that that vigilante was re- recast two or three times over this podcast and we've never really like like spent time on it like how crazy is that i mean they shot what they said five episodes yeah. five of the eight with yeah. a completely different actor and had to reshoot it i mean seamless which I, I'll, I'll give them credit for you couldn't tell at all that you know what they had to reshoot but i don't think anyone else could have done it you know i mean he's, yeah. he's perfect as the character yeah it's uh it's really interesting that whole thing that happened but it's hard to tell where, you know, that original actor is and where Freddie Stroma begins, but I think it was a great idea to recast, and I'm glad that it was done because I can't picture anyone else in the role. So after the intro, uh, we get a little bit of moments with the with the cow again, with the, with the butterflies, and it's all very low-key. It's a very low-key beginning first act for the finale with everyone just getting their bearings on both sides, preparing for this inevitable conflict with the usual hilarious back and forth written by James Gunn. This episode is also directed by him and also has a pun in the title. It's, it's cow or never. <clears throat> These play on words just continue to delight me every week. But then um, they get out all the helmets because it's, it's prep in time. And one of the biggest things they have to their advantage is the helmets made by the, by the genius racist, Augie Smith, rest in peace. Not a real one. Well, don't rest in peace. Rest in um, uh, racist shambles. There we go. Uh, so they have all the helmets lined up, and they're trying to uh, figure out what they could use to their advantage with Harcourt sort of pointing out, you know, the different tactical options they could have with it. And when they do do that, uh, we find out what all the different helmets do, do and it's a really hilarious moment. What do you guys think of the of the Scavies helmet becoming canon, Jackson? Well, it sounds even more dangerous than we thought it was. He said it was a, like a large radius, like a few mile radius, giving everyone <laughs> Scavies. I mean, you know, when uh, when Augie talked about, it, he said, you know, every man should you know have Scavies at least once in his life or deal with Scavies. I didn't know you were talking like giving you know an entire small town Scavies. So it's you know it's it's a little more dangerous than he let on. Yeah, only the wearer of the helmet doesn't get it. Everyone in a one-mile radius gets the scavies. How do you feel about that, Christian? Could they use that against the butterflies? I don't think they're going to throw scavies at the butterflies and walk away. Um, I do want the uh, the underwater helmet, though. That was like another, like, like this, <laughs> this, the underwater. Like, what is what he called it? He called it underwater world. That's what he called it for some reason. <laughs> Like, what is this? What is his racist dad's infatuation? Yeah, I think it just confirms that Augie's both a racist and sort of an idiot. Because yeah. I, I don't know what the I practicality of these things are. I think Augie wanted to confirm all the rumors about Aquaman on Facebook. I think that's why he made it. <laughs> and there's another really funny one, anti-gravity, in which um, <laughs> there's a really hilarious conversation that happens from it because they say how, they ask how it works and if you just float aimlessly and Peacemaker says no and that he has a tiny hand fan to guide him <laughs> to like to like push him in directions and then he said one time he was in like Cambodia or something and he used palm leaves to to get him to move different directions and James Gunn's writing man like credit to him he writes the funniest things and he makes them sound so casual in conversation with the actors and their delivery it is hilarious but while he says that he doesn't know that out of bio activated it and it just slowly floats away in the background and by the time he finds out it's too late and it's it's just hilarious now what i want to ask you guys is if you could make a peacemaker helmet what ability would you would you give it christian how was there not one that like causes the the person that's wearing it to be invisible 
like for a racist, like that's perfect. That's that if, if a racist is making it, like you want to be invisible to infiltrate these random whatever the the these these <laughs> terrorist movements that you think are terrorist movements, like that's your in. That's right there. How are you how do you have invisible a invisible helmet? But the only thing is everything turns invisible except the, the helmet. helmet. So it's just a floating yeah. peacemaker helmet. <laughs> Jack, so, what about you? What would you I wish you'd give me some Prep time. I think I'll just go it's with. Better uh, on the spot. It's better uh, let's the go spot. with chicken pox. How about we give people in the mile chicken pox? Let's do that. If we're already oh on the scabies, I'll be on the scabies thing. Oh my god. Or, or, or shingles. Shingles. If you've already had chicken pox, I guess. <laughs> oh man. If I had a peacemaker helmet, I would. I would have a peacemaker helmet with with laser vision. A laser vision oh, peacemaker that's, helmet. That's too. That's too practical. Kind of like the X rays. Okay. How about how about one that um makes you unlike the anti-gravity one it makes you super heavy like a 600 pound <laughs> there man. we go that's what i'm, there that's we go. What I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> so they on decide... top of an enemy vehicle and just crush it with 600 pounds it. <laughs> well, you're stuck there you can't move <laughs> made it. He didn't think it all the way through. <laughs> okay so they decide to go with the sonic boom helmet right they're gonna decide the one used in the pilot i didn't think that helmet was going to come back but it does so they decide to use the sonic boom helmet to um sort of use it as a bomb to dis- to like cave in the ranch which has the cow buried underneath they're trying to teleport and to do this very key thing they rely on Eagly. So Eagly's the key to the to this. He decides to tape a walkie-talkie to it to the helmet so you could activate it. And then the whole group tries to hype up Eagly to go and drop it off at the barn without anyone being noticed. And I want to know what you guys thought of that hilarious scene at the beginning. What did you think of the Eagly hype up moment, Christian? I thought I tweeted it last night during the Peacemaker party, which I also posted like a set photo uh, of all the cast members with all the separate helmets. And people are like DMing me thinking that I took it. Like I didn't, I didn't take the picture, ladies and gentlemen. I just, I just saw it, and then I, I posted it, and suddenly people are thinking I'm on the set. I thought that the Eagly moment was hilarious because you see Vigilante over the shoulder, like being like the, the nagging mom, repeating everything that Dad Chris is saying to Eagly. They're co-parenting, right? Like they're, they have the, they, they've kind of grown a lot closer. We saw in the last episode, he called him Vig. He was more worried about Vigilante uh, being hurt in the explosion than he was his own father. Um, I think that that was just another sign that they're a family. They're growing into a family. These, if not the whole group who uh, uh, Cena clearly can't trust, he's got this little family with Eagly and Vigilante for sure. Jackson, what do you think of the Eagly hype up moment? I mean, they put their they put their stock in the right bird. I just think, uh, I mean, he he's a free guy, you know. He he's free. He wants to do whatever he wants. And so, <laughs> in that moment, he thought the play was to drop it, you know, in the, the closer proximity, a little bit, you know, to the west or you know whatever. He thought that was the right thing to do. Um, you know, he he goes off the beaten path. I think that's what makes him so good. Yeah, you can't train an eagle without stealing its soul. That's what Peacemaker said in the in the second episode. So Eagly takes it. There's this really triumphant music in the score. It starts it starts swelling up, you know, like they're like, oh, my God, he's going to do it. He picks up the helmet. He takes off. And then he just goes the opposite direction of the farm and just drops the helmet in the middle of nowhere and sort of loses it. And the music stops. And Harcourt gets really pissed off saying, why did you think the bird understood what you were saying? And she's like, let's go just look for this stupid hat. <laughs> so they they all separate because they need to find the Sonic Boom helmet. You know, Harcourt goes looking for one direction, Economos and Vigilante, another Peacemaker in another direction. And um, while they're looking for it, you know, they all get time to reflect. Vigilante talks about the circle of life with Economos in a really stupid conversation that's also hilarious. And then um, Peacemaker goes off on his own looking for the helmet. And then we get a really disturbing scene here sort of looking more into Peacemaker's psyche in a, like, both, like, a metaphorical and a literal sense because he starts seeing his father. He starts seeing Augie, you know, dressed casually, you know, not in his white dragon suit. He just looks like his father. And he's continuing to berate him, saying, you know, things like, you thought you could get rid of me that easily and go ahead, shoot me. And it's really weird because Peacemaker or Chris acknowledges him but he's still thinking practically because, you know, Augie tells him to shoot him again. 
And then Chris is like, I'm not going to shoot you. You're you're in my head. I'm going to use my blow dart. <laughs> and so it's a really creepy scene. It's also really funny, but it's got a really deep layered like tragedy to it. I want to know what uh, what you thought of that of that uh, hallucination scene in the context and the the consequences of it. You think, uh, Jackson? I think, you know, this this trauma that Chris is feeling is not going to go away overnight. And I think, you know, he's I mean, we're just, you know, a mere, a mere few hours away since he killed his dad. I mean, it's still obviously lingering in his mind, no matter how many jokes he makes and fart noises he makes. Um, you know, he murdered this man who was obviously the most important figure in his life, for better or worse. And it's not something that's just going to go away. But he has. To, and, but the, 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 the good thing is that he fights through it. And he doesn't take whatever his father is saying at face value and like pushes through. And even in this moment, he uses it to his advantage. And, you know, Hardcore comes up and sees him acting all, you know, crazy hallucinating. But, you know, his hallucination leads to them finding the helmet, which makes him, you know, it makes him an, an asset in that way. Even though, you know, he's a little off his rocker right now and going through a lot of trauma. You know, he's he's doing the best. He yeah. Can. Christian, what do you think of the racist ghost? thought the racist ghost i thought the lead up to it i'm not sure if 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 you fellas caught it but like peacemakers walking with like this walking stick it's a twig like he's it's not offering any support to this whole uh. man that john cena is and he's barely using it and he drops it dramatically when he sees his father um <laughs> But I think it's just a testament to the way that uh, James Gunn writes trauma, right? Like, just because he killed the physical embodiment of his father doesn't mean that the trauma that his dad left behind over the years. And we don't know. We have no idea. We have, we've only seen Keith dying in that pit. And then we've seen, uh, you know, the relationship with him calling him the F slur and all that stuff as an adult. We don't know what happened in between. We don't know where his mom is. We have no mm -hmm. idea. Like, it's just a lot of, a lot of unresolved trauma that honestly i'm i'm glad there's a season two and i'm glad that this this racist ghost appears here because it sets the stage for you know a future uh, appearance from robert patrick i finally got yeah. his dad's name right robert, robert patrick Pat i'm so glad that james gonna find a way to keep him because obviously the character he plays is terrible but man he's such a good actor you could tell he had so much fun with this episode in particular just the faces and facade and the bravado he was putting on in his performance was just incredible. Yeah, even when he gets really the blow dart it. to the forehead, like he, the face he makes and the dramatic fall down, like <laughs> it's that's very, very cartoony. Yeah, because it's, it's like, like, cause it's like, 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 like a, a, he, when you point it out, like wait, wait, it's a very cartoony, kind of like a, you know, like a caricature, like in Chris's head, how he sees his father acting. You know, it's really interesting. It's kind of reminds me of like an Arkham Knight, the video game where Batman is just constantly seeing Joker everywhere. I don't know if you guys played that game. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a gamer myself, and I've played that game. Big okay. gamer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so after that, no, no you're not. But okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, I am. Anyways, you guys uh, play games? <laughs> Hardcore. Oh, I have some on my phone. <laughs> Hardcore finds Peacemaker blowing darts into a tree. And before she can confront him on that, like Jackson said, they find the Sonic Boom helmet and they come up with the plan B because Eagly plan failed and Eagly took off and they never see him again until the end of the episode, which is <laughs> hilarious. So they just, they kill one of the butterflies on the perimeter that is conveniently the same sort of shape, I'll say, as John Economos. And, and like the sunset in the background too, like that was such a beautiful shot. Why yeah. was that shot so beautiful? It was gorgeous, and then he just walks up and stabs him in the ear. <laughs> yeah, he st Peacemaker stabs him in the ear, takes his uniform, uh, gives it to Economos because I didn't pay attention to this. Some clever writing from James Gunn. He's the only one that the butterflies don't recognize or know. The butterflies have seen all of them, and or the ones that have lived have seen you know them and recognize them, but no one's seen Economos yet. So he's sort of their secret weapon again, just like. Uh, episode with the gorilla and so he puts on the the uniform and walks in and it's a super tense scene because he's just walking through surrounded by all these super powerful humans you know taken over by butterflies that are like emotionless and trying to take over the trying to take over the world in a sense and he walks away and someone asks him what he's doing he's like what are you doing and so he just turns around and like in his most emotionally possibly he's like i'm gonna go put this bag in there and the guy just looks at him, he's like, okay, I was just checking. And he turns around and leaves. For some reason, that works. 
and Economos goes down the stairs and he sees the cow for the first time. I think he's the first one that sees the cow out of all of them. And he's immediately flashing back to the Suicide Squad film where he saw Starro just from a monitor. And now he's seeing this cow in real life. He's like, nope, no more kaiju stuff. No more kaiju stuff. He puts the bag halfway down the stairs in the into the like lower levels and takes off. And Steve Agee puts on one of my favorite performances in the show. He's one of the MVPs this episode. As he's getting out of there, um, the same detective who asked him why he, where he was going it confronts him again and says, why did why did your human color his beard like that? <laughs> and this dye beard joke, it's like, it was like a Chekhov's gun the whole time guys. And we didn't even know it. Like the whole time, dye beard, dye beard, dye beard. I was like, wow, James Gunn thinks this joke is really funny. And it's not that funny. That was my thoughts throughout the series. But it turns out, you know, it was all leading up to this moment, right? Because Steve Agee is John Economos, you know, he's confronted by this guy who, to him is also a fellow butterfly who just has all these memories of the humans and they just say it, you know, they just say how those humans felt or how they were. This was a bad person. This is how they felt. This was a good person. This is how they felt emotionless. And so here John Economos is like forced finally to confront who he is and why he is and what he does and like the most emotionless state ever. But he clearly starts choking up where he starts saying things like, Oh, um, he did it because he thought it made him look younger. He never had a girlfriend and he thought it would help him. And no one really noticed until one guy wouldn't stop saying it over and over. And he's got Peacemaker and Harcourt in his ear this whole time. And they're watching him from afar. And Peacemaker clearly sees like the his, how his words affected somebody. And he just looks down in shame because he's also forced to confront how he made someone feel. Like someone he considers a friend now. So I want to know what you guys thought of this hilarious but also really emotional and really sad scene from Steve Agee who killed it. What did you think of that, Jackson? I mean, it was great. I mean, uh, Economos has been kind of on an upward trajectory these last few weeks. I mean, killing the the, the gorilla and, and just having all these great moments of the bonding and like his characters finally kind of stepped up, stepped up especially with the, the uh, with Murn out of the picture now. Um, and this moment kind of just like bookends his entire story of just this, you know, guy who keeps being the punching bag and he like he doesn't want to, you know, he hates taking it. But I mean, he's just, this is who he is, but he finally lets it out and lets people I mean, not, you know, not having being forced to do it, but he finally lets out his emotions and tells everyone how he feels. And I think, yeah, it hits Peacemaker hard. And I think even Harcourt, who gives him a hard time all the time. That just, you know, this guy's a, he's just a, he's just a guy trying to get by, you know, just working a job. You don't have to be so hard on him. He's not, you know, he's not hurting anybody. He's not doing anything wrong. So I think it was a kind of an eye opening moment. What about you, Christian? What'd you think of that performance from Steve Agee in that whole scene? I mean, it's once again, it's about the found family. Like this guy who was just like, he's the hacker. He was cast typecast as the chubby hacker in the suicide squad and now we know so much more about him uh because gun was able to expand on not only this notion of peacemaker but also the supporting characters um economos is kind of like the heart and the soul while we might think out is the heart and the soul of the team she's got her own thing to deal with outside of the team economos it clearly only has the job right now that's why he's dying his beard because he's never had a girlfriend he's got no and and he knows what time fargo is on remember that like he he makes fun of vigilante but he knows and, what and time. also his wallpaper on his computer is himself i love a it. selfie on a it. motorcycle yeah, i wanted to talk about that when we got his. there it was it was incredible it was incredible <laughs> i mean clearly he thinks highly of himself yeah. it's just everyone else kind of gets him the hard time i don't think he I don't think he's like very down on himself. I think he just like wants other people to see that like maybe there's more to him. Than I just, think he know, didn't realize how guy. down on himself he was until he had to tell that butterfly yeah, how maybe he not. really feels. You know, it's like a, he understands really how people scene. see him. Like he doesn't yeah. understand where he fits in the world when there's like he's met like he clearly knows Batmite and he he knows Green Arrow clearly from the the name drop earlier in the episode. Like he's a part of he's a small part of this huge 
Justice mm-hmm. League filled world. He doesn't know where he fits in. So he kind of has to, you know, squeeze in where he can. And suddenly there's this guy who looks like John Cena playing Christopher Smith, who who notices him and recognizes him, even if he's like poking fun at him, like he's seen finally. And I think that's I think that's the intent that Gunn was going for. This guy who is a small part of a big world is seen finally by someone who is also a part of this huge world. Yeah, it's a it's a really good scene with Steve Agee, but it's all for it's all for nothing of it at the end of it because he manages to get away when he says that truth about himself and you know the butterfly that he was that was interrogating. He's like, yeah, humans are so pathetic, and so you know the economist leaves quietly. But uh, one of the racist prisoners that's now being taken over by a butterfly shows them the bag. They're like, hey, who put this here? And he takes out the helmet from the bag, and everyone sees the peacemaker helmet in the bag that economist was carrying. And they all begin start. They all start chasing him down. It's a terrifying scene with Economos running in an open field with like thirty something butterflies behind them in pursuit. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And um, out of bio drops the walkie-talkie in the in like the leaves, and she's desperately trying to find it. It's kind of it's sort of like forced tension, but it still works. And as they all start to swarm him, out of bio finally gets the walkie-talkie. He says, "Activate sonic boom into it where the to the walkie-talkie is connected to the helmet, and it, it blows up." the one of the butterflies and it blows up the the barn and, and the and the enclosure that has the butterfly starts caving in i mean the cow starts caving in and all the butterflies start going to that distracted and economos is able to get away safely and that's when the big action set piece for this episode comes in it's the season finale they have to go all out it's vigilante it's harcourt it's peacemaker with this peacemaker shield with the devil peace on it and his p90 they, they go in, guns blazing in the open field with the butterflies distracted by the sonic boom after Adebayo does it like three or four times until it finally, you know, loses charge. So they go in there and the theme song starts playing, Do You Really Want to Taste It? And it's just an incredibly choreographed scene with amazing action with Peacemaker, like, you know, using his, his gun to, like, shoot the shield to deflect it onto someone's face. Harcourt just shooting people left and right and shooting butterflies trying to escape. Vigilante doing his thing too with the sword, decapitating some people. I want to know what you guys thought of that amazing action scene. Jackson, what do you think of the big set piece for the season finale? We need to talk about the shield. Um, <laughs> that Because that is my standout. I mean, the things that John Cena did with that shield are, you know, I, 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 I can assume, I don't want to put words in everyone's mouth, but I can assume he does his own stunts I'm sure Christian, you know Thank better you. than anybody. He I does. can. I, okay, I would. I would assume so. The things he was doing with that shield, whether they were real or not, were incredibly impressive. I mean, he he hits the one guy in the air and like smacks him down. I mean, and the the way he even though he lines up the gun and hits hits the guy right in the head with the shield. I mean, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say it surpassed any MCU Captain America shield stuff, but like it was it was it was up there. I mean, it was some <laughs> impressive shield work. Yeah, there was some shield work missing from like maybe the first Captain America movie, I would say. But like the other two Captain America movies, I think the choreography is like online with those, I would say. Christian, what did you think of the absolutely stellar fight scene on the ranch with Harcourt, Peacemaker, and Vigilante? Goddamn bloody was it. Like Vigilante decapitates a dude within seconds of it. And then Harcourt jumps off of a, a human butterfly and then murders a real, actual butterfly escaping a dead body. Like yeah, she Gunn just is, lunges at it with a knife. Like, yeah, so, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely insane what they do with this with this fight scene and the scale of it. Like, I'll always think about um, because it's my favorite. It's, it's, it's my favorite movie of all time. Infinite Avengers Infinity War, when you can hear the voices of other actors calling out after the snap happens. Like I always compare things to that because that's such a that's such a gratifying moment for a movie fan. But like looking at the camera focusing in on John Cena holding his shield, shooting a butterfly, but also seeing Vigilante flip around in the background doing his own thing, and then the camera pans to him. Like it's just such a it's such a small space, but there's so much happening in it that it's yeah. just like like holy, like holy, like holy shit! And the camera starts following Peacemaker because Harcourt tells him to go into the 
the tunnel underground to kill the cow while they hold him off. So the camera starts following him like gorilla style while he's running. And there's a butterfly hot on his tail right behind him too, like an actual butterfly flying. And then it gets shot off camera. You don't know if it's vigilante yeah, or hardcore. I, I love, I love that that happened. It made, yeah. it made it so much, it feel, made it feel so much more real in like an actual battle. Yeah. It doesn't matter who shot it. It's dead, right? We're following Cena into yeah. the, into the, into the uh, cavern. And We're then, not, it doesn't matter who the, shot it. And the, and one of the detectives fits fits one of the, the poor guy who got taken over by a butterfly it, it follows peacemaker and it starts you know doing that weird butterfly scream at him and then a uh, machete just gets him in the face just chops it in half and it's vigilante and he says hands off my bff it's a very violent but also wholesome moment and you know it, it's it, the whole guy's <laughs> face in half like yeah. that poor yeah. and the reaction <laughs> like the way they, they edited it where he's reacts to the blade hitting his face and his eyes moving back and forth like just just yeah, I, I, this is peak. This is peak DC content for live action. Yeah, so um, it's all fun. We're having a good time, you know. Like you both said, we're loving it. We think it's so cool. But then it starts taking a demented, little scary little turn. And I don't know about you guys, but I got so scared when I started watching it because the music starts becoming like distorted and the lyrics start slowing down. And the music starts just, you know, not like sounding out of tune or whatever it was, what they did with the editing of the music. While Peacemaker gets falls down the tunnel, he gets like caved in by debris and then it cuts back to Vigilante and he's like gets shot in the back and he just goes, oh, darn it. And kills one more and then passes out on the floor. He and throws Har- that knife, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. And then Harcourt gets shot multiple times while she's killing a bunch of butterflies. She's taking so many down with her for every shot she gets. She kills a butterfly. And she falls over, and the music at this point, the theme song, Do You Want to Taste It? You know, Hardcore starts tasting her own blood as she starts choking on it. And the camera just, you know, has like an overshot, an over, uh, an overhead shot of, you know, her lying down on the floor, just bleeding out, choking on her own blood. It's a really dark scene. What do you think of that tone shift, Jackson? I think we forgot, or at least maybe I did, you know, for a few episodes here, ever so briefly, that, you know, this is the same guy who made the Suicide Squad. And, you know, this is a show about Suicide Squad characters. So maybe, you know, holding on to, the, you know, being attached to people was maybe just something, a luxury that we shouldn't have had. It, it, obviously, you know, how it turns out, it was that ended up being the case. But it was one of those moments where it was like, wow, like may, maybe maybe they do succeed, but maybe they, you know, these guys don't make it out alive. You know, they, they, they give it all for, for everything. You know, they give it all for the world. I am glad that things turned around, but it was dark. And I felt, you know, I felt legitimate like, wow, like they could, they could go out here and this could be it what do you think of the tone shift at towards the end of that action piece where it goes from fun and badass to kind of scary and you know mortal peril uh christian listen when i saw my baby vigilante get shot i freaked out i definitely i, I went full full interested I, I was leaning back i sat forward a little bit when i saw him get shot um, but we didn't see, we just saw him fall out. We, they made sure to like close in on, uh, a hardcore Jennifer Holland's face a little bit, the blood coming out of her face, which was reminiscent, um, to when Sophie song, the butterfly went straight down her gullet. Like it was kind of reminiscent. The blood went on the same side of the cheek, blood covered on the same side of the face. Um, so I thought, okay, James Gunn is, he's taking this this series and he's kind of this is this is my girlfriend my future wife obviously with the way that the relationship is played out on on the internet and on social media (laughs) he's gonna kill her off i'm gonna kill my girlfriend (laughs) off just to show you guys that i don't believe in nepotism or any of that crap (laughs) she's gonna die right here and you're gonna watch her die because the song cuts off right there on her like like clearly on her face then it cuts to um economos and uh out of bio i was like okay she's dead Vigilante's not dead. He's clearly the future of the franchise. But I was, I was, I was applauding Gunn's decision to not only like kill this not, first Mern, right, and then Harcourt, which was the second leader of the of the group, but his real life girlfriend, who he clearly cares about and gave this role to. And there's all these rumors of her showing up in future and in, in the future of the DCEU. Like I thought, okay, she's dead. She's done. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful way to go out. She led her troop into battle and then she she took one for the team allowing uh cena to go into the, to, to fight the cow which i think we're going to get into next right because that's what we're getting into next uh isn't that quite yet but it's out of bio 
who sees from the binoculars Harcourt in the distance, you know, on the floor, choking on her own blood. And the whole season, the whole first season, different people, whether it be Economos or Myrn or her wife or Peacemaker, uh, they've all told her she wasn't made for this. And she sees someone who she considers her friend now, you know, on the floor in danger. And she goes and gets some guns. And Economos is like, what are you doing? You're going to get yourself hurt. She's, she's, she, and she's just, all she says is she turns to the camera and she's like, I was made for this shit. So she's finally embracing her inner Waller and she goes out there just guns blazing in this wide shot of her like running across the field. You can see her like in a distance, like sort of like her silhouette, just headshotting butterflies left and right. She's just kicking all kinds of ass. It's incredible. I love Autobio. I didn't think I was going to like her as much as I did. But Danielle Brooks, oh my God, the line delivery, incredible. Another MVP of this episode. She goes in there, guns blazing. She sees a butterfly is about to go into Harcourt's mouth. Harcourt starts choking on it. And she grabs it from the mouth, yanks it out, holds it up, and then just headshots it while she's holding it. Like, you know, like Dirty Harry style almost. It's incredible. I want to know, Jackson, what did you think of Autobio's finally time to shine and her embracing who she is? I know we talked about her a lot on the show, um, but I do think she is the MVP of this show. And I, I've said it every week, you know, that she's the she's the point of view character, the kind of, you know, the, the, the most the closest that we have to being part of the show is her, you know, is, is this person who gets roped into this situation because of hard times. But her finally giving in and only doing it because people she care about uh, are in danger. You know, it's not about it's not about this larger this thing or doing what she mom wants or doing what her mom wants or doing what Peacemaker wants or any of that. It's about saving her friends and her her found family, like Christian mentioned, and just and and you know she has the skills they they're in her. She just was down on herself because of the situation and all the pressure on her from all these different angles. Yeah. Well, she kind of like kind of alleviated it after all this time and said, "Screw it, I'm doing it for myself." And and had this monumental moment. Yeah, Christian, what'd you think of it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Adebayo has said, uh, at least in episode uh, seven, that she's not made for this shit. She said it to Harcourt, um, and then she said it to Myrna, and she probably said it to Economos as well. But she was, right? She was handmade and built by Amanda Waller, or she just deviated from the path. Um, she found this woman that she loves and she has these little pet dogs and this family that she, that she loves in Gotham city and wants to raise his family and grow old with. Um, and I think that it's important to note that, um, Adebayo could have been anybody, right? Adebayo could have been someone that fit the bill of like Megan Fox or, or these like typical, you know, these, 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 these attractive white women that fit these roles, but James Gunn purposely picked Danielle Brooks because she was like kind of made for this role. She gives off this kind of genuine, like sympathetic, empathetic, um, badass role where she's capable of anything, but she doesn't want to do it. She just wants to sit down and have a beer and and watch TV with her wife and and kiss her hot <laughs> wife. Like she's <laughs> she's one of the most relatable characters because she's been bred for this by her well, just the same way as Peacemaker and same way as as Bloodsport. Like she has yeah, been yeah. raised by this war soldier that is Amanda Waller, this like gunslinger who we still don't know her past in the DCEU, but she just wants to settle down and raise a kid. And, and now she sees her chance to save people that she genuinely cares about just because she took a job. Yeah. So she does. She saves Harcourt. She manages to take out a lot more butterflies and then she goes down to help Chris and frees him from the rubble. And as soon as he gets out from where he's stuck under, uh, Sophie, Detective Sophie, Sophie Song, now known as Goff, uh, starts kicking the crap out of Peacemaker. And Autobot tries to save him by putting on the human torpedo helmet that Peacemaker also had at the beginning that I forgot to mention. But he also had a human torpedo helmet that he said could potentially break every bone in your body. Luckily, it doesn't, because Autobot uses it to try and save him from Goff, but she... she her heart's in the right place. She is, she, she tries her best, but you know, she uses it and she sends her flying in the wrong direction. She slams into a wall and gets knocked out momentarily while Peacemaker just watched her. And he's like, I told her not to use it. Like he doesn't care that she tried to save him. He's like, I, to I told her not to use it. <laughs> and then finally we, f we learn truly what the butterflies want. Cause Sophie doesn't go for the killing blow on Peacemaker. Instead, she, Goff just goes, you know, She's like, I want to show you something. 
And then she brings them into where the cow is and where Locke, the Locke butterfly, is trying to get their machinery working. And she's like, I need your help to teleport him. And she's like, I know you want to help because you you took care of me. You know, you, you fed me. And I know you're you're the right kind of person. You'll join me just like Judo Master joined us. And we understand why Judo Master joined. Because their planet, the planet of the butterflies, you know, met the same fate of, you know, of misinformation and distrust and other sorts of things that led to the fall of their planet because nobody really believed that their planet was dying and they didn't want to change their ways. They were too set in their ways. And so they believe the same thing is happening to Earth, so they want to so they want to be preemptive about it and do a sort of preemptive strike in the sense that they want to take over the minds of, you know, uh influential people to stop the course that they see supposedly that Earth is already on in the same age of misinformation and uh, you know climate change and things like that they believe that you know they can stop it before it happens and so um they start trying to manipulate chris with his vow and he starts flashing back to killing that random man to killing keith to killing rick flag and he remembers the vow he took a piece at any cost and the butterflies or goff more specifically is trying to use that to get him to to join them i want to know what you guys think of that overarching theme of peacemakers vow that's been touched upon in the series and how it's sort of now correlating to the butterflies and peacemakers being put to the test here to see if he really has the same beliefs as them what did you think of that that whole uh moment jackson well i think i think that vow prior to this episode would have meant something or prior to last episode excuse me would have meant something different to him but i think him coming to terms with his brother's death because the moment we see right before uh keith dies is him telling is keith telling chris that you know to screw white supremacy screw white power you know it's about rock and roll and which is which is it's in in my mind is you know just just freedom right the ability to do whatever one wants and i think the ability to make choices and i think chris in this moment maybe two episodes ago three episodes ago might have given in to what Goff had to tell him because he, you know, that that was his vow. That's who he was. But having confronted all these things about his past and about how he never was able to make his own choices. Um, I think, you know, this is a, this is a different situation now and I'm glad he did what he did. Um, and I think that he's finally become the person that he was like actually meant to be. Uh, Christian, what'd you think of that whole scene? And what do you think of Chris's climactic decision when they confront him to see if his vow really means something to him? I think brother Jackson hit it right on the head. I think that they built this as a moment where only, uh, John Cena's Christopher Smith could face this cow, um, and this decision. And again, I, I mean, uh, you saw weeks ago when, um, uh, Adebayo delivered the oh the the subtlety of a uh, all the, uh, oh, the the white man has to uh, use one word over a different word like blah blah blah. People are saying James Gunn is using this to further his own political beliefs, but no, like this is this is real. Like we see that um, Sophie Song's character uh, uh, now Goff, she's she's literally laying out what it was like for those of us who lived through the pandemic, like the the minor inconvenience of. Uh, it means that you're we're taking away your freedoms and uh, following populist beliefs over science. Um, like these were like real things we were all living through. James Gunn was also living through. Like he's trying to say something. And through John Cena's character, I think he's trying to say that we can all have that ability to grow. Like he didn't care about anybody. We saw him in the Suicide Squad. He doesn't care how many dicks he has to eat on the on, on, a, on a beach to to fulfill his his oath and his vow of peace. So when they used the word vow against him and he saw right through it, I think that was John Cena's character coming through as like one of these like true pinnacle DC characters where it's not about the past, it's about the future. And, they're, and, I, and, and I don't know, John Cena really, really like glowed in that <clears throat> scene. He had that, that tear mm-hmm, coming down mm-hmm. his eye mm-hmm, when she's mm-hmm. holding his face and they had one cheek and then another like, oh, is she going to turn on him? Is he going to turn on her? Like, what's going to happen next? Mm-hmm. John Cena's acting his ass yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he just responds with a simple, when she confront, we know she confronts him with this choice, he just makes a simple statement. He just goes, activate a uh, human torpedo. 
and in the camera pans and it's Adebayo barely recovering from the last one. This time Chris activates it and then her whole body starts glowing because of the helmet and it takes her off and she goes straight through the, I'm assuming she goes straight through the heart of the cow killing it in typical grotesque uh, James Gunn fashion with alien bodily fluid all over the place and her covered in goo and he kills Locke and then he sh- he shoots uh, Goff in the chest, not killing Goff, but just getting rid of the host body and he apologizes to Goff and says, I'm sorry, but I can't do this. And so they do it just as simple as that. Peacemaker kills the cow using out of bow as a human torpedo. That's not something I thought I would say at the beginning of this podcast uh, seven episodes ago. But yeah, here we are. Out of bio is used as a human torpedo to kill the cow, to kill the Mothra. <laughs> and so Peacemaker and Autobio uh, get up from the wreckage and he Peacemaker picks up Harcourt and Vigilante gets up barely. And Economos, who had broken his leg over a fence earlier, uh, sort of like, you know, starts limping his way. They're all leaving together. And guess who shows up too little too late, but none other than the Justice League. Jackson, you want to talk about that scene? I mean, come on now. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it was, it was, you know, uh, earlier in the episode, Autobio called her mom, uh, Amanda Waller, and asked her to send the Justice League. And when that happened... And given all the the mystery surrounding this episode and the kind of, you know, that James Gunn and everyone was keeping it so close to the vest, I was like, okay, they're getting the Justice League in here. Now, who and what and in what capacity, I had no idea. And so when they showed up, that didn't shock them. The silhouettes didn't shock me, right? It was like, okay, yeah, that's a really good bit. It was the Jason Momoa, Ezra Miller actually appearing, having a funny little back and forth, uh, cursing, which, you know, we don't get the opportunity to see our superheroes curse very often. <laughs> um, given, uh, you know, how the PG 13 ratings on the big screen. Um, so it was welcome. It was, it was, it was shocking. And I think, uh, it couldn't have been better than it was. Yeah, it was great. Uh, Christian, what'd you think of the surprise cameo of Ezra Miller and Jason Momoa and the rest of the justice league stand-ins? Man, I had just told Jackson last week that I didn't think they were going to do the cheap, the the Disney Plus esque cameo at the end, but then when they did it, I was like, okay, this this works because it's hilarious. They're letting yeah, they didn't put as much weight to it as Disney Plus does. They didn't put as much weight to it as Disney Plus, no, Plus does. It was, it was as much casually. Stock in it. Yeah, yeah. And he like he just comes in. They do the bit. John, I never thought a an, a, a world would exist where John Cena, John Cena. Is playing a character calling Aquaman and the Flash dickheads. But James <laughs> Gunn gave that to me, and I'll forever be grateful. Um, I don't know what the hell was going on with uh, Superman's hair. Whoever was doing that, the the silhouette for him, uh, uh, Wonder Woman felt like it was her. Gal Gadot standing in the moment. Um, but that was just such a such a solid bit just to bring it yeah, all together yeah. because there was so many jokes. Yeah, over the yeah. Life. Like Batman should have been there. There's a lot of Batman yeah. jokes. Aquaman should have been there because there's a lot of Aquaman jokes. Wonder Woman, who was IF and Peacemaker from across the room in the, the, the elementary school scene. Like it makes sense for them to interact yeah, yeah. with this guy. Uh, because clearly Peacemaker is a huge deal for DC, like not on screen, but behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's they're great, hilarious cameos, Ezra Miller and Jason Momoa. We're so we're such good sports about it. Obviously, it's really hilarious to see and Peacemaker treat them with such a casuality, which is refreshing because in the Disney Plus shows, you know, like all the Avengers are revered, them and their and their eight figure, ten figure contracts, they're bowed down to any time they show up in the shows, or in the Star Wars shows either. The CGI robot characters are also praised whenever they're seen and revered, but here, the just that you're here, Peacemaker's just like you're too late. Go, go, go do inappropriate things with another fish. Robot Luke Skywalker shows up and everyone just stops. Sasha Banks, of all people, just stops and pauses. And and when John Cena sees the Justice League, he just walks right past him because he's got better things to do, like save Harcourt. Yeah, so they go to the hospital at the end of that, leaving the Justice League there to clean up the mess, hopefully. So, um... It's where everything starts getting wrapped up nicely, you know, like there's a 
there's a montage. First, Peacemaker finally comes to peace with Autobio after she came to help him out. They make peace with each other. She apologizes. He forgives her. He says not to tell Vigilante, but after Eagly, Autobio is his BFF. And that really hits Autobio in the, in the heart. You know, it really hits her in the soul. Danielle Brooks portrays her emotion and her sadness and her love for Peacemaker so well in this scene. And she decides to do the right thing and she exposes Task Force X and her mother, Amanda Waller. She's finally embracing all sides of herself, not just the parts she wants to to hide from her mother. You know, she, after being a badass and saving, um, after, I'm sorry, <laughs> after being a badass and saving the uh, Harcourt, she finally gets to you know, uh, also embrace her other side, also with Waller, and confront her mother by exposing her. It's a very powerful scene, and it brings her character full circle, really. So after she exposes Project Butterfly, we get a montage of Chris in the hospital waiting for Harcourt. Harcourt cries because she's never felt so emotionally and physically vulnerable, and Peacemaker's been here for her this whole time. And um, Vigilante and Peacemaker are still doing dumb stuff, blowing things up. Uh... It's hilarious, you know, it's like sort of returning to the status quo, but slightly different because also Chris sees seeing his father sit on the porch with him and with Eagly and with Goff, who's drinking the last of the amber fluid because Pe Peacemaker still hangs out with Goff because they're cool like that. But it's a very interesting way to end the season. Um, what you guys think of that whole ending montage? What do you think of it, Jackson? Um, I'm glad we're that Autobio took that stand, um, and, and and I don't think it was a way to. I don't think she was throwing a middle finger to her mom. I don't really think that's what it was. I think it was just her forging her own path, and believing that that was the right thing to do. Um, because uh, I don't think I don't think it, I mean clearly you know, just like Peacemaker may have certain you know resentments about his father. I don't I think Autobio also feels similarly. Um. Um, about the fact that, like, you know, you, you were trained in this and you were never really given a choice, but honestly, it did come up pretty big for Autobio in the end. So I think it was just her forging her own path and doing what she felt was right. And then, you know, the hardcore peacemaker moment. I'm so glad those two finally come around on one another with, with actually seeing the humanity in each other and, like, the good rather than, you know, you, you know, Chris doing googly eyes at her and, hit, and her just seeing him as that, that pompous dick. So, you know, they, they finally come together and. And we're able to share this intimate moment after this massive, uh, you know, ordeal they just all went under. And I think uh, everyone is closer. And I think, like, you know, the moment with Chris telling, you know, uh, Autobio that that's, you know, he's she's his best friend. I think that was such a big character moment because he obviously has a difficulty trusting people. And she did betray his trust, but he knows she did it for a reason that, that she was also forced into. So I think there, there was a lot of growth, just so much growth and just a little bit of montage. Yeah, uh, what'd you think of the ominous sort of ending, Jackson, with uh, Augie sitting next to him on the porch, just smiling, oh, you yeah. know, happy, um, satisfied. Robert Patrick looks so right. satisfied, and um, Chris looks I, I, scared. Chris has a lot to work through still. I mean, like I said earlier, it's not an overnight thing. It's not going to go away. And he, but but he does have people around him that are there to help, like like an eagerly and. I mean, seemingly, I, th I know James Gunn tweeted about it, that that Goff is, you know, going to pass away here soon. That was the last of the food uh, that, you know, he gave him um, there at the end. So it's kind of that that's it for him. Um, and then they're going to have to move on. But, you know, he has this group of people around him that that'll be there for him. And uh, I think he just needs to lean on him when when he's struggling and then he'll he'll move on. Uh, what do you think of the way they ended the season with that montage and with Autobile's decision to expose Task Force X, Christian? My biggest takeaway from uh, Adebayo's on-camera speech was that she, like, kind of uh, gave uh, Vigilante his own moment there, right? We saw him smiling at the screen when she mentioned this masked being known as Vigilante, and then he jumps out the window, and then we next see him uh, blowing things up again with his new like literal best friend uh, 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 peacemaker. So I kind of, it, it not only does it solidify peacemakers spot in the DC universe where he saved the world from this alien being uh, invasion, but it also creates a new hero because vigilante feels uh, more like, like secure 
in himself and his abilities and his place in the world than ever. Um, and then we go to um, um, holding uh, Cena holding hands with uh, Harcourt, and then her learning how to walk again. Like they, James Gunn, who is who, who can kill a character like, like none of us know. Um, he kept all of them alive, but not only did he keep them alive, he gave them all arcs going forward. We see Economos and Bell Reeve. Uh, we see uh, Adebayo going back home to her wife, and we finally see the dog in a costume. Um, like he not only like does he create these arcs where uh, they they get a, a satisfying finish, uh, but he also opens the door for them to reunite because they all care about each other. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you know. Christopher Smith, a.k.a. the Peacemaker, is a completely different character than he was that was recruited into Task Force X at the beginning of the Suicide Squad. Because the Peacemaker at the beginning of the Suicide Squad would have definitely taken up Goff on his offer because he was all about superficial peace, a superficial level of peace. But the Peacemaker at the end of Peacemaker Season 1, at the end of the season finale, he sees Goff's offer and he sees it as taking control, as taking liberties away from certain people and he didn't want that he knew that peace would have been superficial it wouldn't have been long lasting it would have been short lived he probably believes and he wanted people to have their own freedom and have their own peace to make their own decisions and I feel like that's incredible character growth from James Gunn as a writer as a director he really took this character that everyone hated that I especially hated for killing Rick Flagg and he just turned him into one of the best characters in the DCEU right now. I think this is an incredible first season of television. And if I was going to give it a rating, I think I'd give it a solid like 9 to 9.5 out of 10. What about you, Jackson? What would you rate Peacemaker's Ooh. first season? And do you have any last thoughts on the show as a whole? Ooh. Um, Rating-wise, I'll sit there right with you. I'll give it a 9, 9.5. Nine um, not everything is, you know, it's nothing is it's very difficult to get perfect, uh, but it's pretty damn close. And I think uh, this show uh, has so much potential moving forward, so much going for it. And I think, you know, this is like this is where I want to see the DC universe continue. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I live for. Um, and, and, and this hit this hit, the, you know, a mark that some of the Disney Plus shows have failed to in terms of just, you know, getting into the root of these characters and the truth of them. I mean, we, we know them from the movies only so much, you know, based on the time we're given exploration. But these eight episodes did so much more for Peacemaker and not his entire, you know, group of people. So I, uh, two big thumbs up here. Uh, Christian, any last thoughts on the season as a whole and your rating of it? I am. I just feel grateful for the fact that, uh, John Cena, someone who you, as you both know, someone I've watched grow on screen, since 2002 as a professional wrestler he's finding his own as a dramatic and a comedic actor um which is difficult for someone from that line of work to obtain the rock dwayne johnson uh, struggles with it uh dave batista he he walks that line he's a great dramatic actor and he kills it in the mcu but his comedic movies like stuber kind of fall under the radar Hulk Hogan, we don't talk about. Roddy Piper, rest in peace. John Cena is that guy who all these professional wrestlers have to look at and be like, he is writing the blueprint for us right now. The Rock might have done it previously with these action films and these, these high-stakes roles, but John Cena has given them a license to go out and expand their resume and their filmography and their, their own talent in a way that no one would have expected. John Cena started as a as a white rapper on WWE TV in 2003, and now he's crying on screen because his racist dad, he was forced to kill his racist dad. I can't thank James Gunn enough for, for giving John Cena the ability and, and, and the opportunity um, to grow as an actor and, and, and as a performer who I hope to see getting some awards shine, hopefully, in the, in the next coming months. Yeah, we'll see. Um James James Gunn saw vulnerability in John Cena and he used it to the best of his ability as a director and I respect him for it. I respect John Cena, Jennifer Holland, Steve Agee, Freddie Stroma, Chikuti Abuji, Daniel Brooks, Annie Chang, all the incredible actors that I didn't get to name and crew and everything involved with Peacemaker. Just an incredible series. Very impressed. I can't wait 
to do this again for season two, guys, because there's going to be a season two. It was announced. But for now, that's going to be it from us. So this is the last episode of our Peacemaker podcast. You're never going to hear me again talking about Peacemaker season one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to everyone listening, all my hundreds of viewers. You're never going to hear me. You're never going to hear Jackson. Guess what? That offer I gave you guys about Jackson following you, that's off the table now. Maybe for season two. Who knows? Subscribe. Follow Full Circle Cinema on Twitter. Follow, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Read my reviews. Read Christian's news interviews. Read Jackson's, uh, you know, op-ed pieces. You know, he likes to write stuff sometimes. He's got a, he's got a voice. <laughs> uh, do I? Yeah, you do. And I wish you trust it more. <laughs> Anyways, that's it, guys. Where can they find you on Twitter, Jackson? You can follow me at Jackson Hayes sixty-seven. Christian, where can they find you on Twitter? Kylo Cool Six Three Zero, baby. And you can follow Full Circle Cinema at Full Circle Cine, C I N E. And you can follow me at This Is Underscore Ernesto. And that's it. Thank you to everyone who listened to this hour-long podcast. I appreciate it. I love you. Peace out. Give peace a chance. Goodbye.